That seems good. I'm stealing that Orochimaru uh, joke, by the way. I just did the the yoinking jutsu. Okay. Yeah, it's called it's called the the yoinking your meme jutsu. The Americans think this is how a no fly zone works. Yoinking no jutsu. Ha singan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See what is this? Let's play a game called Communist Posters. Oh, yeah. Communist Propaganda Posters or Gay Couple Vacation Picks. Oh, this one, right? Is this... <laughs> I've only seen the first one because people used to make fun of uh, me and Will and say, this is me and Will. Man, Soviet, propaganda Soviet posters are so good, though. Holy shit. As much as I hate brutalist architecture, I love Soviet agitprop. Crazy that we didn't ban them from SWIFT completely, but our U.S. corporations quickly did the State Department's bidding. I mean, I think it's vice versa. Those but are some wicked examples. Thanks for seven for months. Mo of for the content. most part, I think it's a collaborative relationship where the uh, corpo side oftentimes has profoundly more influence over the government side than vice versa. But when it comes to foreign policy, because the bourgeois capital owning class understands that the bourgeois capitalist state has their best interests at heart, they will follow along with their foreign policy. Brutalist architecture is peak human achievement. Cringe leftist. Shut the up, okay? It's it's just it's dog shit. I'm sorry, I said it. It needed to be said once again. Ukraine Go to Berlin, today. dude. Please look at the look them. at the buildings there. It is so gray. It's so dull. It's so bad. I'm sorry. It just it's not good. It's not good. I I said it. I said it again, and I will keep saying it. I do not like brutalist architecture. I'm sorry. I'm Take sorry. Money, big himbo. Okay. Out of all the European cities I've been to, and I've been to many, and there are uh, there are beautiful, beautiful cities. Oh my lord. Oh god. Barcelona is incredible. London, Chelsea, incredible. Just you know, especially as uh, someone who's been living in America, I've been starved for like uh, you know, well-preserved, relatively well-preserved cities in comparison to the United States, by the way. Paris, London sucks. Le Mafayao. You guys think London sucks because you are incredibly spoiled, okay? You're spoiled and you're selfish. So and you've grown fat the hour ads now. with the culture that you see in every inch, in every ounce of, of your beautifully designed cities that have been around for a very long time, okay? The skeletons of, of uh, English cities are, 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 are Roman, you know what I mean? That's like America just, uh, Vienna is uh, beautiful too. America just built cities like the, on crack, okay? You spoiled little shits. You don't understand. You don't understand what it's like. At Come live Senate, here. Putin it's a, it's literally one parking to lot next to another, side, okay? It's disgusting. Bullshit. It's literally just a, a, a consortium of strip malls that look gray and dull, or not even gray, tan. It's like tan colored. Ugh. And it sucks. Absolutely. And then you go to Zurich and you're like, what the f is this shit, dude? Holy f it's perhaps best demonstrated. Like the the colonialist efforts obviously are not are not demonstrated in the cuisines of the countries that we talk about because like the empires uh, historically and notoriously have dog shit food. But it is best demonstrated those we that wealth is best demonstrated in the in the cities. Okay, have you ever been to Zurich? Yes, I have. Hey Hussein, can you confirm that you are turning your head because you hear the voices coming from your left too? I know how to get I study architecture is pure truth coming from your mouth. Stream. It's not even just architecture, it's city planning too. Oh yeah, the very dark shit food of France. Okay, okay, fair. France is different. France is, is cheat codes unlocked though. Here's like five more people three. say, oh, French cuisine is not bad. It's like, yeah, okay, I can cheat too. It's literally butter and garlic. What are you, what are you talking about? Like everything is good. It's like saying Italian food. Yeah, you no know, shit. It's good, dude. It's carbs. Oh wow, that's crazy. Mother you eat bugs. When it's doused in that level of butter and garlic, I eat bugs. I've eaten snail, okay? It's so goddamn good. It's a cheat. It's a cheat code. Straight up. British food, on the other hand, suffering, okay? From just, just pain. It's so awful. Not even edible. Don't know. Boiled chicken with mashed peas, bruv, on the side. Jellied eel. Beans on fucking toast, yeah? Hey, it's no. alright. question mark. Three months. Fog. Yeah, I fancy a bread sandwich. Anyway, let's listen. Let's watch the, uh, you know, the, the beans on toast equivalent of uh, political commentary for, from friend of the show, one of our favorites, uh, Cuck Todd. Wow, that's the audio. Is really think it's possible. Three months, love you, Ajahn Denkies. Uh, why rule out the no-fly zone? Why not make Putin think it's possible? Hmm, I wonder why. Let's think for a moment. And I, I posted about this on my Instagram story last night. 
Uh, there was a YouGov study that was there was a YouGov poll that was conducted. Okay, I that I to found to be slender. really, really, really interesting. Okay, I found to be really, really strange, really interesting. The YouGov poll showed, uh, and we've covered it before, I believe, uh, on the stream as well. But the YouGov poll showed that at the center wait, by where ten is it? months. You Here. Me through dark the the uh, you go pull from a couple days back showed and there is commentary. net support in the United keep States for sanctions, work. sending money to Ukraine, sending weapons to Ukraine, sending troops to NATO countries, and a no-fly zone at plus 25. Ukraine in NATO, plus 20. Cyber attack on uh, Russia is at zero. Sent soldiers to help not fight, minus five. Drones on Russia, minus 19. Airstrike Russia, minus 33. Sent soldiers to fight, minus 35. Now, the reason why Americans, and I'm not faulting them i am faulting however cuck todd and and the media the reason why i am not faulting americans for this is because we have very deliberately and very carefully in our media manufactured consent and have made no fly zones seem like something entirely different than boots on the ground military warfare for some reason, well, not for some reason, because we do this to Libya. We do this to, we try to do it in Syria. We try to do it in other countries. So we have to justify doing it. So people don't think what no-fly zones actually are. And you can do a no-fly zone for countries that you can bully mercilessly with your, with your imperial war machine. But you can't do that to Russia for the same reason that you can't actually put boots on the ground inside of Ukraine and get I into an war. active hot war with Russia. No fly zone and sending soldiers in the fly, uh, fight are the exact same thing because people don't understand what a no fly zone is. Chuck Todd knows better, but he's a piece of shit and he's lying to the American people. He's misinforming the American people, okay? A no fly zone means you have to enforce it. It means you have to have planes, American planes or NATO country planes flying sometimes from NATO countries into Ukrainian airspace and shoot down Russian planes, okay? That is how no-fly zones work, but Americans don't know this, okay? And the reason why they don't know this, the reason why they don't understand it, and I do not fault them for this, is because clearly if they didn't think uh, of the consequences, if they didn't think of the consequences of a fucking... Uh, uh, sending soldiers in the fight, Standard they wouldn't say plus, ago, uh, they wouldn't say minus GF 35 on that. Poggers, X you get day. it? They get World War III. They get nuclear holocaust. They get that this will cause that. But they think this is different than this. It's because we've done it time and time again, and it's because we've propagandized no-fly zones Keep up as though it's something work. different than boots on the ground military warfare. No-fly zones have to be enforced by American pilots if we're doing it with Americans. They have to be enforced by with American air superiority. They have to be enforced by shooting down Russian fighter jets. Okay? It's not some magical barrier. You don't go Wingardium Leviosa uh, on Ukraine and, and, you know, lift up Ukraine. Okay? It's not Harry Potter. It's a war. Gigahaz. But people don't get that, which is what people want. No, they don't. They don't want that. If I were to describe what a no-fly zone is to many people, and I have so far, people, people have asked me literally in the DMs since I've posted that, like, what the fuck is the difference? Like, I don't really understand this. Like, can you explain this to me? And every time I have this conversation, every time I have this conversation, people recognize it's like, oh, shit, I had no idea. My bad. And that is an anecdote that corresponds to the data because the data shows that they clearly have a different people perspective on sending really troops in, Arjan. but they don't have really? that same perspective on a no-fly zone. Hassle. First, uh, again, uh, my admiration for President Zelensky has no bounds. And if I were in his shoes, um, I'd be asking and looking for everything possible from everyone in every place uh, around the world. And as I said, what we've already done uh, is extraordinary. And, and just to remind people, uh, over the past year alone, uh, from the United States alone, more than a billion dollars in security assistance lethal defensive weapons that are being put to uh, very effective service by right. Ukrainians now in, in defense of their country um, and other measures that uh, uh, we're looking at going forward. Just in the last week alone, Chuck, we have delivered uh, more than $200 million worth of security assistance uh, into the hands of Ukrainians. So yeah. all of that is ongoing. All of that's continuing. The president's been very clear about one thing all along as well, which is we're not going to put uh, the United States in direct conflict uh, with Russia, 
uh, not have uh, you know American planes flying against Russian planes uh, or our soldiers on the ground in Ukraine, because for everything we're doing for Ukraine, the president also has a responsibility to not uh, get us into a direct conflict, a direct war with Russia, a nuclear power, and risk a war that expands even beyond Ukraine. Wow. Even the warmongers are saying this. I wonder if we will learn a lesson from this. Probably not. I'm sure that the media, which has a responsibility to accurately tell the truths and to accurately disseminate information, will do their due diligence and describe the difference between a no-fly zone, or rather the similarities between a no-fly zone and just like a the likelihood of World War III happening in the aftermath of boots on the ground military warfare and hot war between Russia and, and any NATO country uh, due to Article 5. Hmm, probably not though. Probably Cuck Todd will keep crying and saying, oh, let's go. Uh, let's get it. You know, no fly zone, baby. Let's do it. Uh, to Europe, uh, that's clearly not, not our interest. What we're trying to do is end this war in, uh, in Ukraine, not start a larger one. Let me ask you this. And, and by the way, point, keep, keep in mind what, yeah. again, keep in mind what a no-fly zone, just, just so people understand, too, uh, what a no-fly zone means. It means that if you declare uh, a, a space uh, no-fly and a Russian plane flies through it, it means we have to shoot it down. <laughs> Wait, why didn't they describe it like this when they were talking about Libya? That's interesting. I wonder why. I wonder why the, the expectation of a no-fly zone was like way, way higher hmm that's crazy man it's weird it's like oh because libya can't do anything that's right it's because they don't have nukes oh that's tr that's oh totally dude there you go that's why the hasanabi doctrine stands okay if you want to make sure that you can have a you know make sure that you have any sort of sovereignty any sort of autonomy from western imperialist superpowers that want to your shit up gotta get nukes my boy rule number one get those mother nukes baby russia is recruiting syrians for urban combat in ukraine u.s officials say moscow is looking to help from foreign fighters to take cities including kiev nice okay that's cool that won't be bad that seems good i'm stealing that orochimaru uh joke by the way i just did the the yoinking jutsu okay yeah it's called it's called the the yoinking your meme jutsu the americans think this is how a no-fly zone works didn't the bbc explain that it uh, it that they would need to shoot any anti-aircraft vehicles and the SAM equipment on the ground too, and these could be placed outside the zone but still fire into it. All seems to get even more complicated. Yes. Joinking no jutsu. Ha singam? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, let's hear let's hear from yet another politician that would normally be hyper reactionary, bloodthirsty. You know, just uh, salivating from the mouth on uh, potentially doing more war. Let's Almost let's hear what he has to say no about enforcing a no-fly zone. The Senator Marco Rubio from Florida, the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Senator Rubio, thanks for joining us this morning. You were on that Zoom yesterday with President Zelensky. Are you and your colleagues now more open to a no-fly zone? You know, the the look. A no-fly zone has become a catchphrase. I'm not sure a lot of people fully understand what that means. That means dog. The reason why it's a catchphrase is because of you and other pieces of shit like you. Months. You, you deliberately misrepresented and lied to the American people for many years whenever you wanted to do a no-fly zone anywhere else. But now, now you want to do a no-fly zone to a nation with a nuclear arsenal, and you can't do that anymore. So you're like, oh, I don't, who did this? We're all looking for the guy who did this. You're in the hot dog suit okay you crashed your hot dog car into the storefront and now you're going oh who did this we're just how did this happen why do americans think that the you know, no fly zone means like a weird protective barrier or a suggestion like a, a not all out war oh you did this you did this to justify this policy in other countries that you were able to do this to okay flying AWACS 24 hours a day that Ooh, someone should probably spank me on my or spank whoever did this on their bare butt we should go conduct an investigation but like let them let them get away with it in the aftermath means the willingness to shoot down and engage yeah. Russian yeah. airplanes in the sky that means frankly you can't put those planes up there unless you're willing to knock out the anti-aircraft uh, systems that the Russians have deployed and not just in Ukraine but in Russia and also in in, in Belarus so basically, a no-fly zone, it, uh, if people understood what it means, it means World War III. It means starting World War III. So I think there are a lot of things we can do to help Ukraine protect itself 
both from airstrikes and missile strikes. But I think the people need to understand what a no-fly zone means. It's not just it's not some rule you pass that everybody has to oblige by. It's the willingness to shoot down the aircrafts of the Russian Federation, which is basically the beginning of World War III. How about this provision of fighter jets? We would provide the fighter jets to Poland, other Eastern European nations. They would send the jets they now have to Ukraine. Do you support that? I do. If that can be done, that would be great. Uh, I do have concerns about a couple things, and that is sort of, uh, you know, can they actually fly them, given the amount of anti-aircraft capabilities that the Russians possess um, uh, and, and continue to have deployed in the region. By the way, yesterday was a terrible day for the Russian Air Force. They're losing. They don't have air control either there. But th generally speaking, it's something I'd be supportive of, and, and we should do what we can to help them. The president has resisted banning Russian oil imports. Of course, that would send gas prices soaring even more here in this country. Do you support it? I do, and I don't think, you know, I think that's something that you can construct a plan to phase that in uh, pretty rapidly, and you could use reserves for the purposes of buffering that. But we have more than enough ability in this country to produce enough oil to make up for the, the percentage that we buy from Russia. And, uh, and by the way, this notion that somehow this banning system. Russian oil would raise prices on American consumers is an admission that this guy, that this killer, that this butcher, Vladimir Putin, has leverage over us. Why would we want that leverage to continue? Why, why would we have someone like him to have the power to raise gas prices on Americans, which is basically, if he cuts us off, what would happen in the reverse? So, so I think we have enough of it. We should produce more American oil and buy less Russian oil or none, actually none at all. You're yeah, dude, that's, how are we gonna do that? It's like Nuke Andy's being like, oh, nuclear energy is the way. Okay, it takes like, what, 10 years to build a nuclear plant? How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna do that right now? Even if, even if you're not, let's say for a moment that you genuinely are thinking about America's national security, okay? And you're not actually just being like, a piece of shit for your your corporate benefactors okay how are you gonna do that dude how are you gonna do that right now in the interim period oh so unlike the nuclear boys you know what he's saying is is uh, faster <laughs> and more likely to occur even though from what i understand fracking is not even as efficient as uh as as uh, obviously other methods and therefore um i don't know if it's even true or not i actually i don't know i don't know if uh, you can you can uh, truly, truly stabilize prices by uh, increasing fracking. That is, of course, before you uh, recognize some of the negative consequences of fracking. Okay. You're facing some criticism from fellow legislators for tweeting out a picture of President Zelensky during his Zoom with Congress yesterday. The ambassador asked members not to do that because it would endanger Zelensky. Why did you ignore that request? First of all, she said that well into the call. Second, there's no security risk in that at all. I mean, perhaps she was under the impression that the Zoom call was a secret. It had been broadly reported, like multiple outlets, maybe even ABC had tweeted it was at 930. There were over 300 people on this call. The details of the call were emailed to a bunch of people. Not allowing for no-fly zones, but giving other countries just to prevent World War Three. Same, Sam, no. It depends on what Russia considers to be an act of war. I think leading up to this moment, they you can't really stop a country from receiving weapons, right? Like unless you're literally the country's leader, okay? But even then, it's hard. You know what I mean? You can put, you can sneak those little AR-15s in bread baskets, baby. You know what I mean? USAID style. Indian wolf. So even then, one. it's hard. Even if you're like trying to prevent a military coup from occurring, a violent military coup from occurring in your country, it's still hard to stop America from giving you guns, giving your citizens guns. So you're not gonna be able to do that to a foreign nation regardless. But you can't put the F-16s in the bread baskets, okay? You can put javelin missiles inside of uh, food, supposedly food supply. Oh my God, my brother is killing me. You guys probably can't hear it, but in the background it's like, what? He literally opens all the doors in the house. He opens all the doors in the house and then Thanks and then the starts awesome drilling and, and you sound. know, using power tools. And it's like, why are all the doors open? At least close them so I don't have to hear it he's like nah brother you have to hear it and and it was a nondescript picture unlike any of the other one just like the other ones you've seen on the air so uh th there's no security risk there you don't believe you put him at risk no <laughs> i want to also bring it's such a stupid oh god bring up something that one of your fellow republican senators lindsey graham has repeated again yesterday earlier in the week he called for russians to assassinate uh, vladimir putin was that responsible well, look, people are watching what's happening in Ukraine and, and what this man is doing to these people, what this monster is doing to human beings, and they're very angry about it. And, and obviously, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do think Vladimir Putin's going to face some problems internally in Russia. 
Um, how the Russians seek to take care of it is, is up to them. I, I'm not sure that he was calling for U.S. action in that regard. I think what he was basically trying to say, at least my reading of it, is I wish someone would take this guy out and remove him from power one way or the other. I think the whole world wishes that. But that's not something we can impose. That's something that has to happen organically and has to happen internally. And, and, and maybe it will, because he's not just facing a military catastrophe in Ukraine where he really can't win. I mean, the two outcomes he has before him are a costly military victory followed by a costly long-term occupation or a quagmire, but he's also facing a second front at home where his economy is headed to third world status here pretty rapidly. So far, he appears completely undeterred by that. Do you believe he's acting in a rational manner? I think he's acting in a manner he believes is rational because you have to understand this is a guy who views himself as a historic figure. He's, he believes his legacy is going to be secured by being the person that restored great Russia. You can't be a greater Russia without Ukraine under your thumb. And that's what he's pursuing now. I also believe that he's a person that cannot, he cannot survive, for example, being humiliated and he can't survive in power if it looks like he Absolutely. backed down to NATO. So I think that creates a real opportunity here for danger. I don't think his perceptions are the same as our we, we, our perceptions about the world, about uh, the way things are going and so forth. This guy's also an authoritarian leader. He doesn't get a lot of bad news. They don't report a lot of bad news to him because it doesn't get you promoted. So um, I, I uh -huh. unfortunately think we're entering probably the most dangerous part of this conflict uh, because as he begins to realize he can't make the... Um He's not wrong, but there are, of course, as always, as is the case of Marco Rubio, he's also not completely correct as well. Once again, ultimately, it does not matter. If Vladimir Putin wants to restore the Russian Empire, there are limitations as to what we in the Western world can do, right? But here's one thing we can do, okay? Even if his ultimate goal is to overtake Ukraine in its entirety, there is no reason not to try to do democracy and diplomacy leading up to this, okay? All you will lose in that circumstance is a little bit of time. All you will lose in that situation is, is one day of negotiations or a week worth of negotiations, okay? I keep saying this all the time. Like, even if it is, even if it is, you're missing the fact that no Ukrainian wants that, meaning, which means long-term occupation with the population fighting for freedom. I get that. I understand that. First of all, the unfortunate reality is it doesn't matter what the Ukrainian people want because the Ukrainian people also want a no-fly zone. Why is that not happening? Well, because the rest of the world is not going to risk nuclear holocaust. And that is technically a good reason for the record. I'm sorry, okay? Ukrainians want to join NATO, and yet they weren't able to. Why? Because, again, nuclear holocaust. Ukraine is Russia's red line alongside Georgia. And either country being added on to NATO would mean, you know, would have happened. This, what is happening right now would have happened if either country was slated to be added into NATO. Okay? Which is precisely the reason why, with the exception of the United States of America, other European leaders within NATO have always said, we don't want Ukraine to be a part of NATO. So ultimately, it doesn't matter what Ukrainians want. Okay? It's unfortunate, but it's the truth. So now, having said all of that, there is one person, I feel bad for any Ukrainian viewer listening to this, but it's the reality. It is the dark and harsh reality. Okay? What I'm describing is not something that I consider to be good or bad. Okay? I want to help Ukrainian people. Okay? I get it. I understand. Fighting against an imperial superpower at your doorstep that you have historical yeah, associations with is devastating. Okay? It's not great. You have families dying. That's not a good thing. Okay? Do you realize what Putin's terms are? Of course I do. And I'm even saying that maybe Putin doesn't even care about the terms. Right now, Putin is shelling the f out of Ukrainian cities. Okay? Maria Paul being one of them. I have a friend whose grandmother is literally in Maria Paul. She cannot contact her his aunts and her grandmother living in Maria Paul right now and she cannot contact her at all. They have no idea what's going on there. Okay? That's devastating. That sucks. Putin. That's terrifying. That's horrific. And Vladimir Putin is almost single-handedly responsible for this. Okay? In a weird way. In, in, uh, unlike any other country, Vladimir Putin is almost single-handedly responsible for the death and destruction. Okay? That is falling upon the Ukrainian people. I want to establish that. I want to make that clear. On the other hand, however... That shelling is going to continue regardless, right? That shelling is going to continue until they overtake the city. So, there is one thing, there are two things that you could do. Just let it keep happening and give more guns and not anything else, okay? And it's at a certain point, it's not going to, more guns are not going to help, okay? Or, or come to the table with the United States of America willing to make concessions to Russia. 
Concessions that Ukrainians might not enjoy, concessions that Ukrainians might not want. Months, let's go. But concessions that uh, need to be made in order for a, a ceasefire or negotiations to happen. Now, even if Putin makes these demands and some of them are met, like the recognition of LPR and DPR as uh, autonomous regions that are still within Ukrainian borders, because that was the Minsk agreement. And that is, from what I understand, still the uh, attitude and the opinion that he has towards moving towards a ceasefire. Recognizing the uh, recognition of Crimea as Russian territory, okay? The denazification of Ukraine and the demilitarization of Ukraine. Now, the last two are bullshit. White savior Andy take. First of all, the Ukrainian people are whiter than I am, okay? In the eyes of European leadership. So I don't know how the... I, I'm white, but like, pretty funny take from you, okay? Nine but also, my himbo. what I'm trying to describe is this. If Vladimir Putin's goals are to reinstitute the Russian Empire, and he's not going to stop with Crimea, okay? And that he actually wants to take the entirety of Ukraine, then nothing changed before that diplomatic conversation. Yesterday and tomorrow will be the same. There is no reason not to try. That's what I mean. People, on the other hand, keep saying, oh no, uh, we'll just keep sending thoughts and prayers to Ukraine. Diplomacy, you can't do that. You can't negotiate with terrorists, okay? You can't do that, you can't do that. You can't negotiate with terrorists. Like, okay, well then, yesterday and tomorrow will remain the same, regardless, okay? 19 months. So make concessions and start fighting from a worse position? There is no worse position to fight. What the f*** do you mean? In the aftermath of those concessions, what? What will change if those concessions are made? Additional time for Russian troops to resupply and regroup, right? That's what they said about the ceasefires as well. Oh, this is an opportunity for Russia to regroup and resupply. Okay, same for Ukraine. It's an opportunity for Ukraine to regroup and resupply as well. The Ukrainian forces, I mean. If the, the leveling of Ukrainian cities is an inevitability because Vladimir Putin is a psychopathic, you know, warlord, then it's clear to me, if you listen to at least enough American and European leaders, that we are not going to change our attitude about sending troops into Ukraine. That's not going to change. The reason why it's not going to change is because sending troops into Ukraine means fighting for the first time in a very long time, uh, state on state warfare between nuclear superpowers, which is very different than World War II, because we are living in a post nuclearized world. Okay, so what about the jets? Any thoughts on them? Russia considers resupplying Ukrainian fighter jets to be an act of war beyond even sanctions. So much so that Poland has routinely denied the reports that say Poland was going to send jets into Ukraine. Okay. <sighs> I feel like I repeat this every single day. And yet either there are new chatters that come in and ask that question. Or there are old chatters that refuse to recognize what this means. And they just don't. They love hearing the same argument a million Kendall's times. Tactical gains on the ground that he wants to make. I think he's willing to escalate and do things that, um, unfortunately, would be pretty cataclysmic. It feels like a real dilemma. You say that Putin can't win this war, but he also... Oh, so fake news. Glad I asked. Watching. Seems pretty determined not to lose. So what can we do? Well, that's one of the great challenges of these moments. I think there are, if you look throughout history, there are times when you reach points like this. Or maybe right? not. Where there know. doesn't seem to be an easy way out. And, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope I wake up tomorrow and read that there's been this great negotiation and peace is here and there's people are going to be able to get humanitarian aid and the shelling is going to stop. Uh, but that's what my heart hopes for. But my mind, what I know about this man and know about Russia and know about its intentions and know about history tells me we got some ways to go yet until we reach a point like that. And it may not, and it's not going to be a pretty, uh, it's not going to be a pretty journey. I just feel it should be Ukraine at the negotiating table deciding its fate, not its so-called NATO allies. Dude, come on, man. Be realistic, please. Like, yeah, that sounds wonderful and beautiful and, you know, uh, that would be great, but, but there is nothing. Like, that's not a real concept, okay? Nothing gets done in this world, on this planet uh, uh that that small nations don't make choices for themselves or their own citizens without the uh, the go-ahead or clear guidance or allowance by some superpower it could be a sovereign a uh, regional superpower like russia or it could be the global hegemonic power the united states of america okay or the competing superpower that is, is competing with the united states on becoming a global hegemonic superpower china that is how this works it's it's the sad but true reality
there is no i don't know how else to describe it there's just no there's no decision that ukrainian the ukrainian leadership can make for itself ukrainian service member helped evacuate civilians near Irpin. three civilians were killed in russian mortar rounds landed striking a route used by civilians to flee fleeing southwest towards kiev i mean computer enhanced yeah i mean this is going to keep happening by the way of course it's going to keep happening i don't even understand how the f these dudes can't just like not have see shit on like they don't even care they literally just don't give a shit they're like nah it doesn't matter like i'm gonna keep showing it do you equate nationalism to ism dog that's a black sun okay like yes it, it, nationalism in a lot of instances i do equate to neo ism because they are neo but it's got to be super easy not to have that patch on you know versus one talking point is the notification of ukraine these mother can't help themselves from having the black sun patch i just don't get it like the real problem Zelensky can't control troops I have several videos about this yeah i know i know and that is an issue is fetty wap dude what do you mean he's a 1738 not 1488 hey if you like this video please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos <laughs>